The Energy Minister is confident a raft of changes unveiled today will help cut the number of households in energy hardship. But Megan Woods says it's too early to set targets or commit to extra funding for more energy efficient housing. Among other things, the final report from the Electricity Price Review recommends the government establish a cross-sector energy hardship group, agree on an official definition of energy hardship, set up a fund to help households who are struggling to pay power bills to become more energy efficient and ban prompt payment discounts. But not all of these hardship related recommendations have been adopted in full. I started by asking Energy Minister Megan Woods how long it would be before people's power bills started to shrink. In terms of the when, some of it will be quite immediate. So what we saw after the release of the Meridian, uh, the release of the interim report was Meridian um, took the, the um, step to um, drop its um, prompt payment discounts or the, um, as I like to call them, the hidden late payment fees um, for people. And this resulted, has already resulted in $5 million uh, mm. going back into consumers' pockets. And the report estimates that there could be $45 million if all power companies do it. So some of it could be quite immediate. Right, well, soon as you raise that, the prompt payment discounts, if it saves such a chunk of change, as was the case with Meridian ditching it, why don't you force them all to stop that rather than writing a letter to them and asking them to play nice? Look, we are, we, I am going to write to them in the first instance. Um, I've had some conversations where certainly some other companies are open to it, so I want to explore that option. But look, we are preserving um, the option. But they could have done that by now, Minister. If, if they wanted to, they could have done that by now. Oh, look, so why I, not just I think force num- their hands? I, I think a number, of them, a number of them are waiting for the report to come out. But look, this can happen quite quickly. We're talking about a six-month window here um, in terms of people being able to do that. That would be in place for next winter uh, for people when they do do that. So, look, um, I'm going to try in the first instance to work constructively with the power companies. We didn't um, force Meridian to do do Mm. it, and that's delivered $5 million back into customers' pockets. So, Minister, if you're giving them the opportunity, how long's that time frame? How many months are you going to give them to do that of their own accord? Six months is the is the time frame that's built out in the government response that we've released today with the report. But what we will be doing is also putting in place backstop legislation in parallel with this. So we'll actually give us the ability to make some changes if voluntary measures don't come into force. So we'd be able to move quite quickly if that hadn't hap- if that hasn't happened. You mentioned 103,000 households in energy hardship. You, uh, mm-hmm. The recommendation is you set up a cross-sector hardship group. Why do you need another mm-hmm. group when you've identified the size of, of the number of households in hardship and you're obviously using a definition to do that already? So what purpose does the group serve? Uh, well, what the group will do is make sure that we're actually connecting all the different bits of the system that come to address this. I think that what we want to do is look at this from a health angle. 103,000 people um, living in energy has- hardship and potentially not heating their homes properly has health implications for us. We need to think of this from a housing point of view. We actually do need to be thinking of this not just through an energy lens, but what it means for us as a society. Do when you think that number's accurate? Oh, look, actually, what, what this report has done is brought together the most sophisticated data set that we've ever been able to, to use in this country to look at energy use, that all of the power companies did voluntarily. We didn't have to force them actually um, release um, their, their data on power pricing. We were able to analyse that, or the review panel was able to analyse that down to the mesh block level. So we could see at quite granulated levels um, how much people were paying um, and map that across socio economic data. So this, I do have faith in that number because I think this is the most sophisticated analysis we've had of energy use um, alongside other data sets that we have at our disposal as well. Right, because one of the one of the core things for the group to do is to define hardship mm-hmm. so that you get a better uh, energy hardship, so you get a bit, better handle on the numbers. But if you think you've got accurate numbers, why, why are we replicating things here, setting up another group? No, no, look, the, the, they're two separate things, Lisa. So what the, the definition of energy hardship is that in the absence 
of a, of a clear definition that governments were using around what energy hardship um, was, that um, the, the group um, developed a definition, which is someone paying more than 10% of their income on their electricity or energy bill. Um, so what we need to do is kind of just um, check across all the measures that there is the right definition to be using, and that works across all our indicators. This isn't just setting up another, another group. This is about making sure we've got all bits of government um, and the um, other groups that work alongside it pulling in the right direction and addressing the fact that we have 103,000 people in our country who are living in a situation where they're paying more than 10% of their income on, on their electricity bills. That is a huge amount each month to be forking out. So will you use those numbers to set reduction targets? Um, what this will do is it will, it will feed into our living standards framework and the broader work that we're doing. Um, we're not talking about setting targets here at this point, but that is Why not? work that needs to be Why done. Why not? Wouldn't that be future. useful? So the reason you quantify a problem is to not? show how you... You quantify a problem to show how much you can reduce it by or, or measure how much you're reducing it by. So why not set targets? Look, what, what that needs to be done is threaded through a whole range of work. That would simply be premature. There's a, there's a range of measures and recommendations that the report makes that we actually need to trial and see if they do make a difference. As you point out, there are a lot of things here that are intertwined, and as the Housing Minister as well, um, how close uh, is Housing New Zealand to, um, or, or wins, to getting bulk deals for, for their clients, bulk power deals? Yeah, look, and that, that's something that um, Housing New Zealand um, and Ministry of Social Development are working through um, on that. There's, we already have some other models where we have bulk deals, essentially, um, through with Grey Power, um, who essentially have a deal with a power company in terms of how, selling how close? to people. So that, that work is well progressed, um, and it needs to be continued to work through. I can't give you an exact date right here and now. So do you have a time frame for achieving that for Housing New Zealand clients? Uh, I'm not going to give a time frame today. That's work that's underway and it's continuing to progress well. The other interesting thing in this report was that, well, it seems that we're not actually being overcharged for power as such. We're the 10th lowest uh, in, in the price range of 35 OECD countries. We're the sixth highest in terms of consumption, right? So we're using a tonne of power. And this report points out that a lot of that is due to our really poor um, houses in terms of energy efficiency. So why would we allow our biggest landlord, Housing New Zealand, to have until 2021 to fix up uh, state houses so that they are warmer and more energy efficient. That would be an easy win if you brought that forward, wouldn't it? Oh, look, you're absolutely right. The energy efficiency um, is absolutely critical to this. Um, and that, I mean, 2021 is actually getting alarmingly close. We're in October 2019 now. That work that is, is progressing through that. We've also introduced the Warmer Kiwi Homes initiative this year that not only um, has insulated 10,000 houses, but has also this year brought in um, the ability for people to put more efficient forms of heating into their homes because we know that that is absolutely Critical. But can you um, see, Minister, this right. sorry to interrupt, but can you see how some people looking at this will think, well, here's two government policies pulling in opposite directions. You want us to be more energy efficient. You want to get prices down and bills down for consumers. At the same time, the biggest landlord in the country has got a couple more years to make these houses more energy efficient. Doesn't it make sense to do it more urgently? Look, I don't accept that they're pulling in opposite directions. Pulling in opposite directions would be if we had no programme of work to insulate our public housing. That it simply isn't the case. We have a programme of work that we're rolling out um, and that actually is moving swiftly. Um, we're also building um, a huge number of new state houses, uh, which are obviously insulated to higher standards, have double glazing, all those kind of things that building code requires. So that they are moving in the right direction. One of the recommendations was to set up a, a fund that people could apply to, in essence, to improve their home and make it more energy efficient. Why, why has that recommendation not been improved? embraced entirely. You're going to give it some consideration, but you haven't you haven't committed to setting up this fund, have you? Oh, look, we can't, we can't commit outside of the budget cycle to setting up funds, but some of the recommendations 
obviously require new appropriations. But I think uh, it is worth remembering that we do already have a fund that does precisely that, and it is the Warmer Kiwi Homes Programme. But this is an is additional fund. It is additional. And so can you commit exactly to that this I, term? Uh, can you give us a commitment to that this term? Yeah. I can't give a commitment to anything that is subject to a budget bid. I don't think any minister would be foolish enough to commit to something before that it had been through a budget process. These are all things that will have to be considered through our normal funding rounds. Because the report makes the comment that in order for this to work, a lot of these policies are tied in together. There's no point identifying uh, people in energy hardship if you can't then help them make the changes they need to. So these policies go hand in hand. So... Absolutely, and this is, this is exactly where our wellbeing approach to budgeting comes in, that we're not seeing this just through an energy lens. We're seeing this through a, um, a housing lens. We're seeing this through a health lens. And that's the way that we very much approach the Warmer Kiwi Homes Fund when we set that up, that we, we know that we can make a difference in, in people's lives when we insulate their homes. And for the first time ever, um, recognising that it's all well and good having an insulated home, but if you don't have an affordable, efficient heat source in that home, you're not going to heat it. And that's why it has been a priority for our government, making sure that we are getting that support to people, because not only does it improve people's health, but that also reduces our energy consumption. So one thing that caught my eye was that Mercury analysed the winter energy payment, the government's winter energy payment. And this report says that you could pay the entire energy bill of every person in that energy hardship category um, and you could also purchase energy, energy efficient appliances for them all by using that fund. So why not use it for targeted help rather than giving it to a number of people who may not need it? They're not means tested. Oh, look, I mean, one of the things I know as a local member of parliament is the absolute difference that winter energy payment has made um, to people and their ability to heat their homes over winter. I've had so much feedback from the people that I represent about the fact that actually they are able to keep themselves warmer and more healthy through winter. And uh, that's fantastic, is Minister. That is, that's fantastic. But what about the people within that group who financially do not need that money but are still getting it? That money could be targeted, so why not use it in a more targeted way? Look, I, I, I'm not convinced there's a whole lot of people in that group that don't need it. But what we do know um, in terms of people on superannuation, where this argument often comes up, is there's more than two-thirds of New Zealanders that their, pri their sole source of income at retirement is national superannuation. These are, this is one of the significant groups that is being targeted through the winter energy payment. And I know firsthand from my constituents what a difference it is making to that. I think that often it is overblown the argument about the people that don't need it, that are receiving it. Um, and I, when I look at the difference that it is making to people's lives, we're certainly not going to take that away from them. And that's Energy Minister Megan Woods.